that is. And I am here to talk to you about nitty gritty of writing grant proposals. We are going to focus on the narrative today, which um, we just heard about overall structures of um, science-based grants. And you, this trans my background is in the humanities, so like these principles cross over very, very easily, although we don't give drugs to people. But it's you'll have to basically keep making the case for what you want funded and to the institutions or agencies to fund your project. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over a few um, thoughts that I've gathered in my experience. I have reviewed um, grants, institutional grants for the NEH and uh, there are digital humanities grants given to uh, libraries and archives and also for the National Historical Publications and Records Commission, which is an agency out of the National Archives who also give preservation and access grants to institutions like the Institute, the you know, libraries, etc. So that's uh, where I am coming from with um, uh, this talk. So we're going to go over some specifics, then we have an activity. Yes, we will mingle, we will talk, and we will learn from each other, and then we will have a sharing moment for the group after our activity. So feel free to ask questions as we move along. This, you know, we all learn from each other and questions, comments, and concerns are always welcome. So some thoughts, and I'm adding to these thoughts of our other thoughts that um, um, Barry just shared with us. But um, lead time, this, you know, plan ahead. If the applications are due July, 15th, don't start on June 15th. You start on January 1st. You know, you start, you know, move it back. You heard uh, that if, if it's going to go through the Rutgers Rams office, they we're going to need it the 10th of July. So, like, assume that they're going to need it the 7th of July. And from there, you walk back and give yourself enough time to write, to research, to meet with your advisor, or if you need letters of recommendation or other type of additional materials, make sure that you give people enough time. You know, sometimes there's this great grant opportunity that's due next Monday, but like, that's just, you know, that's just life, you know. It, and from a reviewer's point of view, you can't tell when something has just been thrown together and you're not gonna make a good, you know, you, that's not your best foot to put forward. So you really wanna make sure that be, to be as prepared as possible. And the other thing is don't try to, like we said before, don't try to like, Remorph your research question to match that grant. You know, don't try to say, you know, you're talking. Uh, there is a grant for raising puppies and ponies. And you're like, well, kittens are kind of like puppies, but cats. So this will be because it's just, just be honest and and really familiarize yourself with the agency and see what other uh, projects have been funded, so you can get a sense of of where things are. If it's just like exclusively puppies and ponies, or are we thinking maybe young dogs and regular size um, horses, for example? So like that, that's kind of, of where you have to do the research and look ahead of time. Um, the granting agencies have staff, and their job is to answer your questions. So don't feel like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry to bother you. No, like that's their job. That's your tax dollars at work. And really talk to them, call them. If they have webinars, log in and attend the webinars. If they, like for example, we're going to go over an NEH um, fellowship application, they do have, the, they offer the opportunity for review. Take that opportunity. Submit something for review so you'll have the agency's feedback and you you have a better chance of knowing where you stand and where your application is lacking. So don't don't be don't be shy because that's their job. Again the um, this is a you know like you know it takes a village. You have especially if you're thinking about um, graduate or post graduate uh, support like the one that we're gonna look at, um, you need to be have your advisor on board and have your department head on board and maybe you know your grandma should read it to make sure that it's in layman's terms and make sure that what you know your research research question and you want to and what you want to accomplish is clear enough for grandma then you're golden. And make sure that you have that kind of network in place because at the end of the day it's virtual strangers that are not going to be in your discipline that are going to be looking at this and, and saying yes, you know, she or he 
this is a great project, or like, oh my goodness, what were they thinking? And then figure, figuring out the institutional red tape. We are at a state institution, and as such, there are all sorts of rules and regulations and deadlines, and things need to go through A, B, and C, and, and you need to know that. And, you know, the last thing you need is to spend all this amount of work and resources trying to put this together to come in and like your department or the dean at, at the college level, their, their dean's office is like, well, you should have submitted this through the such and such, and their deadline was last Friday, so sorry, because you know, that's, you know, that's just so depressing. And so, you know, I had, uh, again, time, you know, plan it as far in advance as possible and make sure you're aware of what you need, you know, where you need to go and get signatures from, or like a form, there's always a form, you know, there's always forms that need to be filled, and this and that, so that you don't want to be doing this yeah, like the day before it's due at the grants office if it has to go through it. So, so just um, those were kind of like general thoughts and things that I have um, put together for you. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at an NEH fellowship. I think you all had, Tony, oh, you, have, you have your handouts. Okay, these are the NEH funds fellowships for scholars in the humanities, and I know a, a, a couple of, of you are thinking also in terms of your nonprofits or more like community based. But I think it all it, yes. Can I see a copy of what you have? In your hand? I'm sorry. Can I, may I see what you have in your hand, please? Um, we don't have whatever that handout. I have a feeling that Bonnie is making more copies because she handed out what she had. And okay. Now oh, she's goodness. Now she's gone, and there weren't enough copies. Okay, so hand tight, and we're not going to go into anything too dramatic until you have your copies in your hand. So what these um, fellowships fund is all sorts of research in the humanities, broadly defined, as you can see. And like, why don't we, while well, Bonnie comes back triumphantly with, let's take a look at the website so we can all Fellowships. Okay, the National Endowment for the Humanities. Yes, we want to stay connected. So, okay, April 11th. So we have plenty of time to prepare for this type of work. But um, so these are given support to individuals. So this probably would not need. Am I right, uh, Rutgers? Yeah, it's, it is awarded. They are awarded to individuals. So in this yes. case, we wouldn't go through the. So you. You don't need to visit our grants office. Um, a research that is of value to humanity scholars, general audiences, or both. So like everything under the sun, pretty much. But you know, which is great. However, this is now your chance to like put it in, in a way that the reviewers, the agencies, say like this is the best thing since sliced bread. This needs to happen. Here's your money. Um, you can either produce, it's a mostly research, books, digital materials, archaeological site reports, translations, editions. A lot of uh, this specific fellowship also funds uh, turning a dissertation into a book, so that's another um, way that people have used this program, so like, and then they give you you know, the rate of applications, this and that, funding ratio of 7%, so, you know, don't be discouraged. It's also a numbers game at the end of the day, you know, you will get more for every grant you get funded, there's like 20 that you didn't get for many, many reasons, and the majority of the reasons are, oh, such many great proposals, wonderful projects, not enough money. So that's, that's just the way it is. What I like about the NEH, too, is that they give you, as you can see here on the side, uh, sample narratives of projects that have been funded, so you can at least get a sense of of what people have, you know, how people have um, structured their project and how they have communicated with the agency, which is is helpful, especially if this is the first time you're you're writing um, such. Um, yes. And can I can I uh, just add to that <clears throat> that um, and it, it's relevant to a question that came up uh, earlier. Um, one of the things you can do is you could ask, if you know an individual who you're interested in working in or who has done work similar to yours and who has gotten a grant, you can contact that individual and ask them, uh, could I please have the, your grant? Would you send me a copy of your grant application that was funded, <clears throat> funded so I can see what, what it takes? And um, 
you know, on a personal, individual basis, they're very often they're willing to do that. So that's, that's um, in addition to this kind of thing, you can do a person-to-person -person request, and they, they usually uh, yes. comply. And so here, um, and Bonnie is back. Thank you, Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so they explain the review process, how your application, the grants.gov, that's another thing with the, the red, administrative red tape. It's like a government-run grants portal that, fortunately, when you're doing it through Rutgers, the grants office knows the ins and outs of grants.gov, and they're the ones who, that will actually put it in and submit it for you, but if you're an individual applying for yourself, you need to figure this out. Yes? I just have a quick question. Um, I've noticed that we do have scholars here for the Fulbright scholarship, that grant. PhD students for mm -hmm. Fulbright, is that something that's at the institutional level or um, for the Fulbright scholarship? So like in our department we have someone from Chile and he's a oh, PhD okay. um, student and... I think it's, I've seen, I don't, I don't know the answer to your question. Uh -huh. I can answer it. Oh, good. I, I, I was the associate dean of the graduate school and I, I uh, supervise some uh, Fulbright applications. It's done through the through the um, graduate school, but you you fill it out. Mm -hmm. You you do the uh, the whole. You make an arrangement with somebody in mm -hmm. another country who you want to work with, and um, uh, we just uh, you know we can give you some advice, mm -hmm. or the, the graduate school can give you some advice. But it's basically um, you you write the application. So going into the review panel, here are the NEH peer review panel, knowledgeable persons outside the NEH read each application and advise the agency about its merits. So they go in the specifics about how the review process will go first with the review panel, then the NEH staff also weigh in, and then they, they, they kick it up to the Council of the Humanities, and then the, you know, it goes up the ladder. Um, as the applications <coughs> make it or not. So if we go back, now that we all have handouts, yes. So we're looking at this handbook proposal. So what they're asking is for you to give them, so we look at page, let me just jump back where we just were here. So this is exactly where we are now. Program description. <coughs> Advanced research that is of value of the humanities. General audiences of both. Okay, at least they give you what they don't want to fund. So make sure you don't want to pursue curriculum development or developing of teaching materials. And if there are some, um, especially later on, they will give you that, you know, if you're looking for this, may, you may be interested in this other opportunity. So they do kind of put you, <coughs> at least you point you in the right direction if you're not exactly on the grant that, on the type of grant that you should be. Uh, asking, for example, here, they're exposed to um, cultural heritage material. There are um, specific grants for that. Um, again, especially with um, federal agencies, providing access to grant products is an important mission. And this is where we, at the library, can help you and be your best friends. Um, especially science grants have a lot of data um, archiving requirements and you have to whatever you since it's paid with um, tax dollars the idea is that the people should be able to go back and look at the what you know what they bought pretty much so um, the are uh, at Rutgers we have our institutional repository that um, it's <coughs> it's built to keep data in, in, in digital born materials. So, for example, if you have big data sets that need to be archived forever or, you know, for as technologically as long as possible, that is something that we can steer you in the direction and put you in contact with the people who actually run that program so we can, so you can have that piece of your puzzle already figured out. You know, don't say like, oh, data, yes, we will back it up on a CD and I'll keep the CD you know, on a shelf in my apartment, you know, that's not a good long-term preservation plan and access plan too. So moving on, uh, this is not a cost sharing and this is another piece. And uh, today I'm not going to talk about budgeting a lot because that A is like a full, you know, like a full day thing on its own. 
But um, sometimes cost sharing, especially it, this grant doesn't require it because it's given, the money comes to you directly. Whereas if it's an institutional grant, um, sometimes we have to provide money to like say, okay, we're in it together. Mm -hmm. So that kind of money could be like staff time, um, computers, um, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's, you don't need to worry about that. Okay, so make sure you check your eligibility. There's a lot of, um, specifically with currently enrolled students, I think they don't fund students right now at, at this, this particular grant, but what they do is funding if you are graduating. They, it's like, great, if you're graduating, they're fine, give us a letter from your dean stating your graduation and this and that. So like, you know, make sure you are, you're aware of that. That's, there's nothing more depressing than putting all this work and finding out that, oops, no, actually, I couldn't, you know, this is not something that they would fund for me as a student or they, they won't fund me. I don't know, sometimes, wait, well, you may not be a, a U.S. citizen, and sometimes they don't fund U.S. citizen. So that's the type of thing you need to, to you know, co go through a fine tooth comb through the, to, through, um, the documentation and address every single point, even if it's like minuscule or as irrelevant. He's like, see, that doesn't apply. Like, well, maybe it does. Okay, moving on. What we actually want to do is um, look at the guidelines. But first, they do give you the evaluation criteria. So this is exactly, um, and we saw that um, Mary showed us the, the big, um, the grid of the, how the evaluators are going to be be ranking the proposals using these criteria. So, I took intellectual certificates of the proposed project, and this is quite broad in the humanities. So that that's something for you to look your thesis or your research question and why it must be answered. That's where you go in with that. The quality or promise of quality of the applicant's work as an interpreter of the humanities. So how how are you qualified to speak about you know puppies and ponies? You know, and how is that your how will you be the product that you like? Think about it as a business transaction. The NEH will be buying something from you. How? Why is yours the best quality? And how are you prepared to offer the best quality book, um, digital portal? Um, I don't know. And there's also some archaeology specific projects that can be funded through this. So, like, why is it yours the best? Um, how are you? You know, do you have the project figured out conceptually where you stand within similar projects or, or the field of where it is, like when you're saying, like the gap in the literature, what are you solving or what is your contribution? You know, if you, if, if you were not going to, if you were not to write this, what would we be missing in the larger scheme of things and in the, in the field that you're in? Um, the feasibility and appropriateness of the work, including where relevant the soundness of the dissemination and access plans. And this is very important, again, with um, federal agencies and public institutions. Dissemination and access, sometimes people say like, oh, well, just, we'll say that we'll make a website and boom, move on. But it's like, you're going to make a website, who's going to host the website? You know, where are, who are you going to advertise to? How are you going to reach your target audience? How are you going to measure? Uh, that success, you know, you have to give specifics as to how that is going to end up fulfilling the need of of the of the grant program. So when you say that, you know, and it doesn't need to be, I mean, it needs to be as specific as possible, but not too granular. For example, dissemination and access. We will advertise in the newsletters of the Society of Unicorn Readers and the Northwest and Puppy. Association, Puppy Enthusiast Association, and we will present at the, you know, like give specific as to where, what channels are you hitting, and if you're going to, social media plays a big, big part, so don't just say, we'll do a Facebook post, move on. Our Facebook page registers 3,927, an average of 3,927 visitors per week, so we consider that this is another avenue. So like, be that when you throw something, have the numbers and the, and the impact to back it up. So it's it's a solid, um, uh, what is it that we're calling it? Dissemination and uh, access plans. And also with the access, you know, when you say, and this goes back to the website, if you're going to host it somewhere, figure out, you know, yes, you, you set up, you can set your, up your own website and that's perfectly fine, but 
if I were reviewing something like that, I'll be like, great, so once that domain expires, who's going to pay for the renewal of the domain? And if you, or who's going to pay for the storage? And, you know, those kinds of issues have to be, you know, at least show that you've thought about this. You know, like we, you know, the grant will purchase 20 years of domain and five gigs of storage, whatever. And that's not a lot, but, uh, you know, 20 terabytes of storage and, or, or something that, that really shows that you're just giving it more thought than we'll just put up a website and move on. Again, the libraries are your friend. If you're thinking something that needs long-term access, again, our institutional repository is built to, with that mindset to preserve our research and scholarly information and data, the production that you, so, you work so hard in, in, the products that you work so hard in making to make sure that they're accessible to the public for free forever and ever. So that, that's something that, you know, think about. And how likely are you to complete the project? Again, this, and I said before, you, you we're not going to get into budgeting, but you do need to figure into need a degree of budgeting. But I do think it's important to keep in mind that be realistic. If you're telling me that you're going to have to go to research in an archives in the historical society of the Puppy enthusiasts in North Dakota during the summer. That's great, but like, what if what if like the historical society only has like one up? They're open only one afternoon a week during the summer hours. Then it's like um, that's not going to cut it, you know. So those kinds of things you need to figure out when you're planning out your budget. How much is it going to cost to get there? How much do they charge for photocopies? Or how much do they charge for lodging? You know, like really break it down like the everyday and don't just you know yes you can estimate you can get onto orbits and get a sense of airfare to North Dakota in July and get a sense of how many photocopies you may need or you know guesstimate give or take you know at this point you should be so familiar with your subject that you would kind of know like well they do have the papers of the first people that brought Yorkie puppies to North Dakota and started a breeding program there. So I'm guessing that the collection is, you know, 20 cubic foot boxes. So I'm guessing I'm going to need probably 150 to 200 photocopies givers. So budget that kind of specificity because what, what we do as reviewers, we kind of like slice and dice and massage, what I call like massage the budget. You know, is it realistic that this person is going to spend $20,000 in a three week to North Dakota? I don't think so. But if, like, if this person is spending $2,000, you know, lodging meals, photocopies, and incidentals, that sounds reasonable. You know, that, that's, it breaks down for, you know, if it's a two-week trip, $2,000, it's, that's not good math. Let's just say it's $1,400 for the sake of about $100 a day. That is reasonable. So, like, think of it, you know, both ways. Think of it with a feasibility. I, what, are you proposing, or don't say like, well, I'm going to write my 2,000 page monograph in three weeks. And I'm like, no, no, that's not going to happen. So like know yourself and know what, what it's reasonable and average to expect a production of someone in your field doing your work at a certain amount of time and then extrapolate from that. Because we do think in those terms of like, <coughs> for example, in my specific field, one time we got a grant they weren't going to digitize all all these papers, newspapers, and then I went back. We went back and we did the math, and they, we were going to be. They were asking for about like a, like almost like two dollars and thirty cents per digitized page, when like similar proposals, other proposals in the same thing, they were asking for like seventy five cents per page, and I'm like, what the hell are they doing? That is so expensive, or how is it that their cost? is so high when the rest of the pool seems to be, you know, 75, 78, 81, 72, you know, it's within. So like really think of those kinds of, of average costs for the type of work that you are doing. So that's what I have on the but you know, the little that I want to touch on the button. Yes. Are there publication costs yes. in your journal? Uh, in the institutional in, repository? In, in, no, in, in uh, Humanities journals, because we, we get <clears throat> in scientific journals, we can be charged one or two thousand dollars for publication. Uh, they, if, and if it's uh, color public color, uh, colored plates, color figures, they some the journals charge 
and charge a thousand dollars for each uh, color color uh, figure. I don't know if that I don't think there is that, but like there is like if you like if you want to publish a book and you need, for example, to secure uh, the rights for images and permissions, and those are things that are fees that you have to pay either to the copyright holders or the archives or libraries that have the images or the journal. If you're going to have the fancy glossy, it's going to be X, but if you're going to have the black and white regular paper, it's going to be Y, etc. So these are all the things to think about or the budgets, yeah. in the budget. But moving on, the narrative, and here's where I kind of dissected the narrative into specific things. So we're going to go through a narrative, and what we're going to do, I'm going to go through this in 10 minutes, and then we'll give you like 12 to 15 minutes to pair up, preferably with someone who's not in your field, or you know, if you're in science, get a humanist, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and you're going to pitch a research project. You all, you all, I think most of you already have an idea in mind when you're finishing your dissertation. So, like, pitch your dissertation, and then your partner is going to present your pitch to us. So you have to make sure you present it. <coughs> in a way that is that we so we will ask questions and we will all ask questions of the presenters and you know in terms of you know the questions that we were looking at the point of viewers were asking the impact so how does this help solve x or like how do you pretend or you know or how much time do you think you're going to spend in your dakota doing the research on the puppies or you know whatever so that's what i think so like you kind of have to think in those terms of telling it to a stranger and have the stranger tell back to the rest of us and see if we all caught the gist or not. But having said that, so the sample proposal for this um, for this grant program, um, they asked for the intellectual significance of, of the project, the value, and so what we're thinking is what is this question, what is your project, what research question is your project answering, and why do we need the answers to this question? And that's you know, very philosophical, you know, what's the meaning of life type of thing, but that's what you need, that's where you are when you have, um, you know, if you're at the stage of, of already wanting to produce a publication, a journal, or, or kind of wrap up your research, at this stage you will already know where you stand in your field and what your contribution to the humanities broadly defined are. And in terms, for example, thinking of the seed grant that some of you were asking um, earlier in the in our session, they're not asking for the intellectual significance of your seed grant, but what need is that is your project filling? You know, what hole in the Rutgers Newark environment is this project plumbing? You know, what uh, how is this helping advance the you know, there's a strategic plan for Rutgers Newark. So how is your project in line with the strategic plan and helping advance our goals for the next three, five years? So that's the kind of, of thinking of thinking that you need to do it succinctly, clearly, free of geography. I know, like, it sounds easier, but once you keep doing it, it it'll come, you know, practice makes perfect. Again, and then they ask for the work plan methodology, and they, this goes back to going to North Dakota. And, and you know, is it reasonable? Where are you now, where do you expect to be at the end of the grant? At the end of the grant, I will have a monograph. I will have a first draft. I will have, I will have a, con a book contract in hand. Or, you know, so be realistic and have specifics, you know, and, and quantifiable and measurable specifics. Don't just say, well, I'll have a draft. Well, draft, how a draft, tease your draft. I will have a draft for review for this university press in this series, et cetera, et cetera. Or I'll have a 200 page draft, you know, like quantify it and, and put it in, in certain numbers that, that you at least, you know, a bunch of strangers can visualize as they read through your proposal. How will you spend your time? Like I said before, significant benchmarks you expect to achieve. So like, it also tells the reviewers that you've thought things through. You're just like, well, I'm just going to go to North Dakota. I'm going to look at that. I'm going to make photocopies, and I'm going to come back. So that that's great, but you know, like for example, let's pretend our, our historical society in North Dakota is only open one a week. So I will be spending 
having been in touch with the historical study of North Dakota, I will need to be looking at approximately three cubic foot of material. So I estimate that if I do this visit over three Wednesdays when they're open, I should be able to get what the materials I need to continue my research. So like show that kind of like that you know that what you're looking at, what you're doing, and how you're gonna get it and by when, you know, when throughout. Because these grants are I think the shortest are for two months, but like they come up it takes up to a year. So if you're in a really, really ginormous research project, you know, break it down in, and what do you expect to accomplish by when. And next we have <coughs> Full-time commitment. This specific grant asks for full-time. They want you to be doing your research or what you set out to do full-time. Don't just say like, well, I will work Monday through Wednesday and then the rest of the week I will be. Because that, that I mean, you may have whatever, but you, they do want you to be committed full-time to completing the project. So. Um, like I said before, don't say that you're going to write a 2,000 page monograph. You know, just be reasonable and what what the average for your field is. And if, it, if it's a weird average, I'm not saying weird, that should st strike that for the recording. If it's like an average that's kind of like off for whatever reason, but it's like that off, how can I say, let's say like librarians catalog books. If a librarian comes in and tells me, I can catalog 200 books a day, I'm gonna be like, that's not true. I mean, like, what are you? You don't, you don't take bathroom breaks, you don't eat, you don't go home, what's, what's this? But it's like, well, it's 200 books, I mean, like, maybe that specific subfield of literature, it turns out that the books are tiny, I don't know, and then for some reason that metric does <coughs> apply to that specific subfield. This is where you tell, like, you may, it may seem high to catalog 200 books a day, however, in this specific subfield of I don't know, puppy wearing literature, or the books, you know, two, uh, there's only two publishers, and what we're doing is this collection, so like, you're like, oh, okay, so, so I can see that 200 books happening if you're telling me that if this pace that you're gonna go at is normal for your specific subfield. So like, if you're gonna have that kind of, um, you know, with the full-time commitment, again, like I said, with the budget, it should add up. You should say, okay, this is the person who's going to be expected to spend about 40 hours a week doing this. Is this, <coughs> is, is the results that they're telling me they're going to accomplish, are they feasible within the time that they're holding for this? Again, proposing a book, if you say, you, I'm going to write a book on, you know, your key rearing practices in South Dakota in the early 20th century, then, okay, great. What's the book? You know, how are you structuring it? Do you have chap you know, chapters, table of contents? Amazing. Throw it in there. Even if it's just a start and you may up changing things, <coughs> end up changing things at the end of your project because your research took you on a little tangent, that's fine. But do have that, that structure and that, you know, if you're proposing an article. I am submitting an article to the International Journal of, of Yorkshire Terrier Puppy raising and this will address the early breeds that inhabited the you know, were brought to the plains in the early 20th century. You know, like do hone in on what you're doing and who you're doing with. I mean don't just throw like an article, you know, or like even better, a 35 page article, a 2700 word article, you know, whatever is the standard in your field to describe length or or bulk of published version then then that's what you should um, put that's what you should um, put down and then again digital projects you need to show expertise in the technology and the resources that you plan on using so if you are again saying uh, I am going to create this digital library of the earth because okay let's say you went to the North Dakota um, Historical Society um, to look at the collection of the first Yorkshire Terror puppy um, breeders in the region and then there's an immense collection of photographs and then the Historical Society is just going to let you use them and digitize them and you say, great, I'm going to create a digital library for early 20th century to treat, you know, to trace the development of the breed of Yorkshire Terror puppies in North Dakota in the early 20th century. Great, but then what technology are you going to use? How is this? How are you going to scan? Who's going to scan it? Where is it going to happen? Who's going to host the images? 
when what you know you need to get specifics and so you just say like well I'm going to do a Flickr um, account open to the public you know that may be one way but that does not quite have the sustainability and long-term access standards that these kinds of that um, federal agencies are looking for when they fund um, these type of public access programs. So again, this is something that the libraries can help you with in terms of formulating the you know how you, how are you going to structure that digital library. Sometimes we do host things. There's a um, New Jersey Bonnie. What's the name of that New Jersey digital highway? The New Jersey Digital Highway are um, projects that we have collaborated with with local and state agencies on historical collections and that's for example one way that the people say like if they were applying to a grant with the New Jersey Historical Commission they would say and then the Digital Library of Yorkie Puppies Race it, you know early York Charter reading in central New Jersey is going to be hosted at this and with these um, standards for uh, the resolution of the images access, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the type of, of expertise that you, know, you just want to know that you've thought things through to the end. Then we go with the background and comment. I'm almost done. Um, in the area, how are you the expert? How are you qualified to do this? And um, to specify, you know, if there's any sort of, um, if you have to, for example, you're going to say like, well, you know, the material that I'm going to be providing access to is so complex, it's so out there that there's no technology that has allowed the public to have unfettered access to these sources. I am going to program this website portal submission thing that, great, do you know how to program? You know, like, and so if you're going to say I'm going to do this, how do you know how to do that? Like with the programming, are you? What's your expertise in programming, and and what level do you attain? And then sometimes I, I think it's weird if you keep looking through the through the guidelines when they say like you don't need to be an expert, but if you're not an expert, tell me how you're going to become an expert to to accomplish this. So like you know, there's there's that piece that you need to figure out for yourself. <coughs> and then what I said before, if you're going to have to rely on third party either archives or other or collaborators or other people make sure that they are accessible and or you know they will be doing what you're asking them to do in the time that you need them to do it because that that also you know they do realize that you know there are sometimes you know life happens and, and people's schedules change but at the end of the day you want to make sure that you did ask your other collaborator in at the University of California in Los Angeles and that that person is going to be committing to doing whatever you ask them to do in the time frame that you ask. Okay, and then again, project, product and dissemination. So at the end of the day, there's a couple of things that's about audience. You know you're writing the proposal for, the audience for your proposal is the reviewers for the granting agency. So you need to either get a sense of who, where they're drawing the reviewer pool from, or these um, university faculty, are these members of the community, are these administrators at the university level, you know, who's, who's the group of people you're going to be writing to so you know at least, you know, not to go over too many basics or get too um, out there with the, um, with the, I mean, you have to really put it in, in, a, in, in a common ground for the group of people that you're writing to, but then your project is going to, when you're talking about the public, you know, is going to benefit um, high school children in how they learn about, I don't know, history or how they learn about, like, how they learn about being an adult in a contemporary world because X, Y, and Z. So, like, you have to have that audience clear and cut from the beginning. You can say like, it's the general public, life will be better for the citizens, citizens of New Jersey. Like, which citizens? And, and how is their life better? How do you know that their life is not good right now? So like, you know, get that audience or like in that, you know, you have data to support that, you know, like, census records, for example, I did, I had a, a, a grant, uh, a seed grant um, a couple of years ago, and I think one of the things for my audience, I did a series of, of workshops on preservation for the community, and I did, mo there were five of the workshops that we did, we did them in Spanish, and at that point, for my audience, I say, the 2010 census showed that Newark has a 38% Hispanic uh, 
Spanish-speaking population. Therefore, this series of workshops in Spanish is aiming to reach and you know connect with this new group of people that were not here 10 years ago and therefore this is why we need spe specific workshop facilitators in Spanish and they are coming from New York so they're more expensive than the local ones so that's why we have to go this way. So you have that data and the, the important thing too is recent data. Don't say like, well in 1984 the passing rate for AP history tests, you know, like, yeah, well, that was in 1984. How are you solving a problem today? How is, or how are you solving a problem now? So make sure if you're going to throw data, statistics, populations, et cetera, et cetera, that is current. One to two years, don't, you know, the world was a very different place, even like five years ago. So make sure that, that that's relevant and it's current and it's something that people can say, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, we've seen the rise of, people buying your child terror puppies. And then again, access and dissemination specifics. We went over these. How are people going to get to the goods at the end of the day? And how are you going to make sure that the goods are available for as long as possible? And with the long-term preservation plan for digital materials, then this is enough, you know, this is again, like I said, it places like the um, RU course institutional repository, they are equipped and built to keep that kind of information and, and data for the long haul. So...